The Battle of Gargamela, also known as the Battle of Arbila, today Tel Garmel in northern Iraq, was one of the most important battles in world history and was the high point of Alexander's campaign, which aimed to conquer the Achaemenid Empire. It took place on October 1st, 331 BC. During the Siege of Tyre, Darius had offered Alexander the Great to cession of all territories west of the Euphrates, 10,000 talents in ransom for his family left behind at Issos, including his mother Sisigambes and the hand of his daughter Statira, who had also been captured. Alexander rejected this request against the advice of his general Parmenion. The great king then mobilized the troops of his peoples as far as India, since this was time-consuming, Alexander initially rounded off the securing of the eastern Mediterranean coast by conquering Gaza and occupying Egypt. In late spring 331, he returned to Tyre. He had the city rebuilt, supplemented the army with 15,000 men from Macedonia, set out in July 331 towards the Euphrates and crossed the river. After an evasive maneuver in front of a blocking troop of the Satrap Mazaeos, the army crossed the Tigris further north in September 331 BC and moved towards the newly formed army of Darius. Alexander had 40,000 infantry and 7,000 horsemen. Although the troops were outnumbered, they consisted mainly of battle-experienced soldiers. The short command chains in particular were decisive in the course of the battle. The corps was made up of the Macedonian troops, along with Greek, Thessalian, and Thracian units. The Macedonians' military branches included the Atiri cavalry, equipped with helmets and armor as well as lances, which were primarily intended for thrusting and less frequently for throwing. The Hypaspists, who were probably equipped in a similar way to the Greek hoplites, but were relatively mobile, and the Pesatiri, comrades in arms on foot, equipped with extremely long spears, sarisa, of around 5.5 meters in length. There were also lightly armed troops consisting of piltasts, slingers, and archers. Alexander's father Philip had built a powerful army from the loose Macedonian tribal contingents, provided the soldiers with land, and settled them in cities. In this way he ensured constant combat readiness and the troops were trained through constant campaigns. In addition, allies and mercenaries from Greece and the Balkans were integrated into Alexander's army. From his father, he adopted the tactic of using the infantry mainly on the defensive in order to bring about the decision at the right moment through a personally led attack by the heavy cavalry. This risky approach proved successful at Gagamila, as in the two previous battles against the Persians. After his offer of division to Alexander was rejected in the spring of 332 BC, Darius mobilized all military forces. According to the sources, almost every able-bodied man was recruited from all regions of the kingdom. His army, which was very ethnically mixed, consisted of regular foot soldiers and horsemen from Mesopotamia, Babylonia, and the coasts of the Persian Gulf. Its core was the Kara, the army, which was permanently under arms. The additional Persian foot troops were mainly servants equipped with a piece of land, who had little combat experience but reinforced the core troops through their numbers. The bulk of the army consisted of troops from the eastern parts of the empire. The cavalry force, which consisted of highly trained fighters, appeared superior. In addition to 12,000 heavy Bactrian horsemen, the mounted units came from central and eastern Iranian regions, from Cappadocia, from Anatolian Armenia, and from the southern shore of the Caspian Sea. There were also horse nomads, Sogdians, Scythians, and others. The Indians provided 15 war elephants for the battle. An old weapon of war was also used, the sickle chariot. This was intended to break up the Macedonian phalanx. The area in front of the battlefield was leveled for 200 sickle chariots. The royal guard was around Darius, behind which were mercenary units of Greek hoplites. These are said to have numbered 30,000 men. Darius had previously reconnoitered the battlefield and had it leveled for his cavalry and chariots. For the first time, Darius' troops used snares, 
colloquially known as wolves, as obstacles on the battlefield. Darius placed most of his cavalry, as well as sickle chariots and war elephants, in the front line. On the right flank, this was Armenian and Cappadocian cavalry, followed in the center by two groups of 50 sickle chariots each, the 15 Indian war elephants and another 100 sickle chariots. The left flank of the front line was made up of the heavy Bactrian and Scythian cavalry. The second line consisted of more cavalry and mainly of archers and infantry, with Darius himself in the center, flanked by the Greek mercenary hoplites. The third line served as a reserve and was made up of infantry troops that were positioned in deep formation behind the center. The troops were positioned in staggered formations over a width of 3 to 4 kilometers. There was no need to fear an encirclement by the numerically inferior Macedonian forces. Due to their smaller numbers, Alexander's troops were essentially positioned in a single line. In the center were the hoplites, arranged in a phalanx, between and in front of which spear throwers, stone throwers, and archers were distributed in smaller groups. The left wing consisted mainly of cavalry and a few infantry units under the command of Parmenian. The right wing was under the command of Alexander and included the Hittiri cavalry as well as the Paeonian cavalry under Arates and other mounted mercenaries under Minidas. Behind the center, Alexander had another phalanx and infantry set up as a reserve. This was to intervene in the event of an encirclement by the numerically superior Persian army. Alexander opened the battle by having the Hittiri cavalry of the right wing expand in a wide envelopment movement against the Persian left wing. As he had hoped, Darius reacted by sending the Scythian and Bactrian cavalry of his left wing into action to intercept. Alexander's mercenary cavalry under Minidas then attempted to break through the gap that had developed between the Persian left wing and the center in a quick attack. After this attack was initially repulsed, Arates took over the advance with the Paeonian cavalry, while Alexander turned in with the Atiri cavalry. In the heavy fighting that followed, the Persian cavalry on the left wing was wiped out and put to flight. While the fighting on the left Persian and right Macedonian wings was in full swing, Darius ordered the sickle chariots to attack the center of Alexander's troops. The phalanxes had prepared for this attack and opened corridors in front of the attacking chariots, so that they literally ran into nothing. The chariot crews were immediately attacked from all sides and quickly wiped out. The feared Persian sickle chariots were thus completely eliminated and had caused only minor losses to Alexander's troops. The phalanxes then formed up again and marched forward to attack the center of the Persian army. The situation was much more difficult on the Macedonian left wing, which was supposed to hold a defensive position. Darius had ordered his right wing, the Armenian and Cappadocian cavalry under the command of General Mazaeos, to make a direct attack on the left flank of the Macedonians. Even though the troops under Parmenian were able to hold the position as ordered, they found themselves increasingly hard-pressed. At the same time, Darius set his war elephants in motion to finally break the resistance of Parmenian's troops. At this point in the fighting, two events occurred that would determine the further course of the battle. After the collapse of the Persian left wing, the complete destruction of the sickle chariots and the advance of the war elephants on the Macedonian left wing, the Persian center with Darius was completely exposed. Alexander now launched a direct attack on Darius' position with his cavalry. At the same time, the phalanxes in the center also advanced on this position. Darius seemed to have panicked and turned to flee, which subsequently led to the collapse of the Persian center. At the same time, a gap had opened up between the advancing phalanxes in the Macedonian center and the left wing, which was still involved in heavy defensive fighting and the Persian and Indian cavalry from the second row of the Persian right wing successfully advanced into this gap. After the breakthrough, they split into two detachments, one of which rushed in a straight line towards the Macedonian base camp, which was about five kilometers to the rear, while the other began an envelopment movement against Parmenian's troops. Parmenian, 
who was faced with the complete collapse of his wing, sent a messenger to Alexander asking for immediate help. The news reached Alexander at the moment the Persian center collapsed. He then refrained from pursuing the enemy immediately and turned his Hetarian cavalry to a relief attack for Parmenian's troops. While the messenger was still riding to Alexander, his infantry reserve reacted to the Persian breakthrough. One part streamed towards their own base camp to confront the enemy there and save their own rear from destruction, which they succeeded in doing. Another part rushed to the aid of Parmenian's troops. For unknown reasons, the attack by Mazeo's troops now collapsed and they turned to retreat. It may be that news of Darius' escape had arrived or that the Macedonian infantry that had arrived had turned the situation around. Part of Mazeus' troops, including himself, clashed with the cavalry led by Alexander. In the heavy fighting, Mazaeus was wounded and the majority of the troops accompanying him were wiped out. After the entire Persian army was now on the run, Alexander ordered all troops to attack. Parmenian, who had already started pursuing the remnants of Mazaeus' troops with his cavalry, was able to capture the Persian base camp a short time later. Alexander continued to pursue the Persian troops until sunset and let his troops rest until midnight, then resumed the pursuit. He hoped to be able to catch Darius in the city of Arbila, about 120 kilometers away, but the Persian great king had foregone any rest and had already fled. 